next speaker, along with co-host Carrie Poppy, investigates fringe science, spirituality, and all manner of extraordinary claims firsthand, so you don't have to on the podcast. Oh no, Ross and Carrie, please welcome to the stage, Ross Blotcher. Thank you. All right, welcome. Today I will uh, demonstrate how to make friends and join religions. And uh, as was just mentioned, I host a podcast called Ono, oh Ross, and Carrie. Uh, so I am the Ross half of that equation. And you can see Carrie there as well. And there we are with our dowsing rods and pendulum. Uh, so this is standard fare for us. If that gives you any indication, the, the title itself, Ono, oh No, Ross, and Carrie, doesn't really say anything about what we do, just that there's two people and they are some kind of troublemakers because, oh no. So this is what we do. Uh, we are interested in the paranormal, supernatural, uh, fringe science, religious claims, um, alt medicine, anything along those lines. There's kind of this range from, oh, here I'm blocking it now. There's this range from uh, things that are you know, definitely true, that we know to be so, to things that are probably true, to things that are questionable, to things that are, really, are you serious? Uh, and those are the things that we're interested in. We wanna know why people believe them, how do they express those beliefs, and what happens when you show up. Uh, so essentially, we do all of the things that we tell everybody else not to do and to avoid. Uh, but hopefully, uh, we allow people to live vicariously or virosly through our adventures. Uh, I apologize, there will probably be more of that. Uh, so just to give you a small smattering of the kind of uh, things that we're doing, uh, kind of working from left to right, top to bottom, uh, there's me in a, a dr what is it, dream reality cinema chair, uh, doing this kind of VR hallucination, guided meditation sort of thing. And there in the center at the top, we are earning our Dianetics certificates from Scientology. That, that one was not easy. We'll talk about that. Uh, and then in the upper right there, we are with a picture of Teresa Caputo, but we went to one of the Long Island, Island Medium's live performances uh, and got to see her prey on people's grief. Uh, and there we are at the Grand Canyon. No, actually that's a uh, creationist museum near San Diego. And we brought a, an, an actual like geologist, paleontologist with us, which was really fun. Uh, there's Carrie in the center coming uh, out of a cryogenic chamber, uh, freshly chilled. That's supposed to rejuvenate you, get you going, uh, help your body repair. It doesn't. Uh, and then there we are on the, the right middle with our Think devices. So you wear this on your forehead and it zaps you periodically. You control it with your phone and you know, it sends pulses to help you either be awake if you need to be awake or to be calm if, uh, if you need to settle down for the night. Uh, so that works at least as well as placebo. Uh, then we have on the lower left, this is a fire cupping. Have you all heard of this? Yes, well, you're at a skeptic convention, but also you know, you've seen it in the Olympics. Uh, so this is like mainstream. So what's happening is, is that uh, the practitioner here has these bell jars and she's putting fire underneath them, creating, a, you know, burning out the air, creating a semi-vacuum and then quickly plunking them down on poor Carrie's back there. And it pulls up the flesh and brings all the blood to the surface and it leaves these awful hickeys. It's really gross and weird. Uh, in the bottom center there, we are uh, at an exorcism, a live exorcism event uh, with uh, Bob Larson. And on the lower right there, we are in a sound bath at the Integratron out in the California desert. So that's just a small smattering of the kinds of things we've investigated. Here's a larger smattering of the things that we've investigated up to this point. So a wide variety of topics, and we do really limit ourselves to uh, things that make claims about how the world works. So. Uh, for that reason, we won't go necessar necessarily to a political convention. I don't know, I won't rule that out. But for example, one time I met someone at a party and they loved the idea of the podcast. And they said, you know what? I can get you into a furry convention. And I was like, yeah, man. Oh, that's awesome. And then I realized, oh, wait, they're not saying anything about you know, physics or science or anything that disagrees with scientists. So uh, yeah, it's out of, our, out of our purview. Oh, wait, there's more. Uh, so this brings us up to current, so we, we just released our flat earther uh, um, investigations. There's more coming. In fact, oh no, we'll talk about that more. But uh, 
yeah, there is there's much more to come, and we never run out of uh, topics. We have this Google list that's, I don't know how many pages it is because it's a Google thing, but it's, you know, I would estimate a good 12, 13 pages of topics at this point. And we live in LA, so there's no shortage of things to investigate there. And people send us more recommendations all the time, so I've heard of almost everything out there. So our tagline is, we show up so you don't have to. Uh, we put ourselves through these awkward, uncomfortable situations for your enjoyment, hopefully. Um, but uh, you know, we say, so you don't have to. So I'm gonna forestall a little bit of criticism that we always get, which is people saying, oh, well, you're saying I can't show up, or you're saying people shouldn't get involved. No, we're just saying you don't have to. So that just rules out that one option that you have to, that still leaves the range from definitely do this, this is fun, to don't do it, it might kill you. It's kind of like when someone accidentally says, I could care less, because that just rules out the possibility that they couldn't care less. So maybe they care a lot, maybe they care just a little, but it tells me you do care. Okay, so what we try to do is we have a lot of fun. We have fun when we're there. Well, we try to get enjoyment out of it. And we have fun on the podcast. So it is a comedy show as well as hopefully an informational show. Uh, and we try to uh, make our humor be at ourselves and at the situation and hopefully not at the expense of anyone who's well-meaning. Uh, we also make new friends along the way, at least until they find out we've released a podcast. But, uh, you know, we... We, we genuinely like the people we meet, and we, we don't have to make that up or pretend. It's just, you know, they're good people. They're just like us, right? Uh, and what's interesting to us is how they got there and, and how they express these ideas. And we try to point out the good. There are a lot of good ideas, a lot of good practices, a lot of things that you can learn from these various things that we try. So we try to share that as well. And then we want to remain open-minded. And we all talk about that, you know, remaining open-minded, remaining open to claims. And that is legitimately tough because we do come in to do an investigation. The idea is eventually to share these ideas with others. Uh, and we do come in with our own worldview already intact. Uh, so it's, I don't know if it's even a challenge, but you know, we have to constantly remind ourselves that we need to be truly open even to flat earthism or uh, flat eartherism, flat, flat earth, uh, whatever, whatever you call that, uh, you know, even to something like that. Okay, let's hear them out. And both Carrie and I come from religious backgrounds. So we've gone through that process of learning new things, trying to adapt to that new information and following the truth where we felt it led us. So I think either of us would be willing at a moment's notice if, you know, L. L. Ron Hubbard happened to be speaking the truth, then, you know, we'd just keep doing the same thing, but now we'd be a Scientology podcast. And, you know, not the end of the world, right? Okay, so uh, to talk a bit more about our investigations, I thought I would categorize it not in terms of pseudoscience and the paranormal, uh, but rather in terms of kind of the special abilities that we've gained after six and a half years of doing this. Uh, and, and they're all kind of masochistic. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's a little bizarre, and I don't recommend most of these things. So, so I'll categorize this into four different uh, absorptions that we have developed. And three of them, I would say, don't do this, don't try this at home, you know, you can let us do it for you. And then the, the fourth one might actually have an applicable lesson. So first of all, we're pretty good at absorbing pain. And so here I am with an ear candle uh, sticking out of my ear. How many of you have heard of ear candling? Okay, uh, yeah, that's pretty much everybody. How many of you have actually tried it? All right, you're my people, okay. Uh, so, so yeah, the, this is a, like a wax, well, I gave it away already, but it's a cylinder uh, sticking out of your funnel, sticking out of your ear, and they light the top on fire. And the concept is, is that you have toxins in your body, they can be extricated somehow through your ear, and uh, this fire is somehow gonna create this uh, vacuum and pull up the toxins. No, it's not. That's silly. Uh, so instead, all you have is the danger of this flaming thing above your ear that could drop little pieces of burnt matter uh, into your ear canal. And so afterwards, they cut it open and they show you, ah, look at all this that came out of your ear. Don't you feel so much better now? Yeah, yeah, I kind of do. Except when you try as we did, you try burning one of these without an ear anywhere near it, and you still get that same chunk of wax afterwards because the wax is in the ear candle. 
All right, this is a particularly uncomfortable, painful experience. This is uh, colon, colon hydrotherapy. I, yeah, you get it. Okay, yeah. I don't, I don't have to explain what's happening here, but I'm wearing no pants. <laughs> Taking one for the team there. Uh, so this is a particularly good example because it lives with me to this day. So this is uh, almost two years ago, the beginning of 2016, uh, at a... Uh, well, fire walking, obviously, uh, s seminar. And so this is in the evening. We had already taken a something like three-hour course learning how to properly align our chakras and balance our energies and to use this very, you know, the secret, like, positive thinking to influence the world and how we could use this in our own lives to encourage us. So that's all very nice and well and good. But we're told that's really the mindset that you need to have to get across these uh, hot coals. So there we are. We've been taking all our classes, lots of copious notes. And, uh, oh, thank you for bringing down the lights a bit because uh, it's in the dark at this point. So we've waited for the... Um, We've waited for all of these embers to die down to a safe enough level, which already tells you that there might be more than just the mind involved. Uh, but here we go. Now we've got our, all our coals laid out. And I think I was the second to get up there and, oh, I can't wait to do this. I've never gotten to firewalk before. So, uh, so here I go, and I'm thinking in terms of, okay, I can do this. I want, I want to play along. You know, I've got my energy balance, and I'm picturing all these things and my, you know, white light aura and everything. And here I go. Nice. All right, ready? Go, Ross. Woo! Yeah. yeah. All right, made it. Everyone's encouraging me, and I wanted to make sure to, you know, not try to walk too fast or anything. I'm going to walk slowly and confidently across the coals. Uh, but then everybody else gets their turn, and there's still coals there, right? So why not do it again, right? So, so I go back, and this time I think, I'm just going to say in my head, you know, I want a little bit of A-B testing. I'm just going to say, I can't do this. I'm a horrible person, I'm terrible, I, I can never succeed at anything, this is gonna ruin me, I'm gonna burn my feet, and here's my second attempt with that in mind. <laughs> nope, still made it, still alive, okay. Well, it was a nice thought. Uh, but being an idiot, uh, I thought, well, there's still coals here and they're just gonna put them out when else am I going to get to firewalk in my life? Took us months to set this up. So, so uh, yeah, let's do it again. Well, just a normal day in the neighborhood, walking around, and uh, oh my goodness, hot coals, hot coals, hot coals, hot coals. <laughs> okay. All right. So, so now I just have problems, and uh, I uh, I've never held onto my phone so tightly as I did in that moment. I don't want to drop that. Uh, so, okay, so now he's done right. No, I went back a fourth time, a fifth time. Here's my sixth and seventh time because I thought, you know what, I should like, I should walk down and like turn around on the coals and then walk back. Look at me, I'm showboating. That's Ridiculous, so they're all encouraging me. So you've got this adrenaline going, you're all excited, and uh, oh, great, yeah, I can fire walk, and yeah, you're looking at your feet, and you see a, a little dark spots, but yeah, I'm sure it's fine. I didn't even use the water bucket, because they warn you if you get your feet in the water, then you can't go back out on the coals, because it will burn you. Again, another nod to the fact that maybe physics is involved here, and not just your mental state. And I'm sure you've all heard, but the reason this works is that uh, the coals are heat conductors, but not the best heat conductors. So if you walk quickly and it's not too long of a track, yeah, you can make it across and be just fine. Uh, but if you change any of those variables, yeah, you can hurt yourself. And so in this case, uh, I was the idiot who um, walked across way too many times. Oh yeah, I was gonna use the analogy. So for example, when you open up the oven and it's been cooking at 500 degrees, you don't touch the metal because that's a really good heat conductor. But the air that comes out at you, that's also 500 degrees. It's just a poor heat conductor. So, uh, so you know, doesn't uh, cause you any damage. So. So no trigger warnings for this talk, but if you don't want to see my feet two days after this event, now is a good time to avert your gaze. Okay, here it goes. 
All right, so I don't know how well you can see that, but uh, I've got the boils and blisters all over the bottoms of my feet, on my toes, and uh, the ones on my left foot cleared up, but on my right foot, I got a case of eczema that is still with me to this day. Like, my foot constantly itches. So, let this be your lesson. If you go fire walking, do it once. That's good. All right, another thing that we've learned to absorb is awkwardness. I think this is just a special attribute of both Carrie and I that, that we almost thrive on the awkward situation. Like, oh, let's just see what happens, you know, in this uh, weird, weird uh, setup. So, so here's a good example of that. This is at a church in Victorville, California, the day before September 23rd also known as September 22nd. Uh, but there were these end times prophecies about September 23rd and how there was gonna be this very significant cosmic event that was gonna happen. So uh, we went there because we wanted to see, oh, what did they do the day before their prophecy is supposed to uh, come true? So uh, here we are. <laughs> I just had to let that run long enough for you to see the do -si do at the end, because <laughs> that's awesome. Uh, so yeah, I could do that all night. And they almost called me on it, too, because before we heard a lick of any kind of scripture or support for these ideas, we had about two hours and 20 minutes of that, uh, which is crazy. So uh, we don't care. We were having fun. Oh, yeah, September 23rd. Any of you remember the big cataclysmic, cataclysmic event? I was hoping someone would remember, because I don't. Uh, yeah, what, well, apparently it was just a, a sign in the heavens, and a, somehow a man-child was born to a virgin, um, some weird uh, biblical stuff like that, Revelation 12, look it up. Okay, so this is another good uh, just uh, example of awkwardness and, uh, and white man dancing at a uh, laughter yoga session. And so... You think, oh, laughter yoga, interesting. So do you like do like downward dog and, and laugh or uh, do you do like breathing exercises? No, none of that, nothing that you would actually call yoga. It's just adults finding reasons to get each other to laugh, which is great actually. We kind of recommend this. This was just a really fun, kooky group of people, but they wanted a volunteer to come up and so here I am. Oh yeah, I could do that all day too. Uh, so uh, yeah, actually we thought this was delightful. Uh, uh, just people looking for reasons to laugh, why not? And they have these hotlines and about eight times a day, you can call in and there will be a moderator there and, uh, and it might be awkwardly just you and them or it might be three people who showed up and they'll do things like ha 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 ha. There's like just random weird sounds. Uh, burk, burk, burk hoping that will, you know, just seem so absurd that it gets you to laugh. And, you know, sometimes it works, sometimes it's just really uncomfortable. <laughs> but what we, what we did was we put on this, uh, like, this mass invitation. We said, hey, listeners, come join us. And so about 60 people called in at the same time. And, uh, and I just, I love the thought of the person on the other line who's moderating this, having no idea why everyone showed up to the, the 9 a.m. laughter session on a Wednesday. It was fantastic. Okay, so another one of our special abilities is that we can absorb boredom, which is really required for these investigations. Uh, so it is really hard to bore me or inconvenience me. I can sit through a lot. So, for example, you can see it on my face there. Yes, I do get bored. I just, I, I suffer through it. There's no sound on this one. But uh, you can see Carrie and I, we're uh, sitting there We've gotten up at 6 a.m. to get on a bus down to Tijuana, Mexico, and uh, visit these cancer clinics, these alternate cancer clinics. Uh, so there's a bit of absorbing boredom here, and there's a bit of uh, absorbing uh, sadness. So it, was, it was actually kind of a depressing one. But yep, there I am eating my apple and playing around with this cool 360-degree camera that uh, can see everywhere all at once. And then Carrie is diligently taking notes of what's actually being said. 
There we go. Wait. I think I scrolled down. There we go. There's Carrie taking notes. There's me with my Apple. Carrie's not the only one who takes notes. These are just uh, a couple or a few of the pages of the 54 pages like this that I wrote for our amazing facts investigation. So this is another end times prophecy group, and uh, they believe that the world's end is imminent, and they let you know all the signs in the Bible. And around, well, let's see, originally they tell you it's going to be, they don't say it's going to be 10 le lectures, but they list 10 lecture topics. You think, oh, wow, that's quite a commitment, but okay, I can do 10 lectures. Well, around lecture 13, you find out that they are a Seventh-day Adventist group, and that this is kind of promoting, you, you know, joining the Seventh-day Adventist church. And uh, yeah, we ended up attending about 22 of their lectures, each one of them an hour and a half long on average uh, out of the 25 total. So we had to miss a few, but it like took over our lives for a few months. It was crazy. Nobody does boredom better than Scientology. So, you know, we all know about Scientology and, and their uh, pernicious practices and all the terrible things they do. And all that's true. They are every bit as bad as their reputation. So uh, be careful with them. But they also excel at boredom and just finding ways to get you to do things. Busy work and uh, tedium. So in this case, we are taking our Dianetics course. So that was a Saturday and Sunday. And between those two days, we spent 22 hours at the Church of Scientology in Los Angeles, that big blue building that you see uh, in all the pictures. So uh, just be thankful for this conference. We actually give people breaks and we don't like try to cram it full of that much information. And it wasn't even that much information, but there's, uh, let's see, you can see the Dianetics logo, that kind of pyramid on the back wall. And to the right, you can just see the edge of the L. Ron Hubbard bust. He's always somewhere around as a picture or a bust or something. And uh, there's Carrie on the right, and she's sitting in a chair, and, uh, and the empty chair is there waiting for me to come back from bathroom break or whatever, and I'm gonna sit knee to knee with her, and we recount our worst memories from childhood uh, over and over and over and over and over. And each time you have to recount more details to the point where they're encouraging you just to make things up. But the idea is that as you make up these additional details, you know, what color, uh, what pattern was the carpet? And what color was the car outside? All of that you're just, you're generating and you're messing around with your actual memories, which is uh, rather problematic. So uh, yeah, we told our terrible stories to each other and they're, they're hoping also to then chain that so that you get the, the bad memory and then you find out that there was a prior to that. So you go to the one that was similar that was prior to that and then you go back again and you keep going back and back and back until you're in a past life or you know, prenatal for a while. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's madness, but you just can't get out of that auditing. That's what auditing is. There's another picture of Carrie there in the Church of Scientology. All right, so... The other thing that we absorb, and this is where I think there might actually be a helpful message here, something that's a useful takeaway, because I wouldn't recommend any of those other things. Why put yourself through the awkwardness, the boredom, and the pain? But uh, when it comes to absorbing absurdity, or as I'm going to call it, absorb the dumb. And uh, I know that's grammatically incorrect, but I think it captures the feeling of the activity. Uh, we all face this, I think, to different degrees from different people in our lives, where we have to just uh, absorb thir certain things that they say and then choose how to respond to that. So we do a fair amount of that uh, because, oh, let's see, well, I'll get to the because in just a moment. So let's give some examples of this. So this is a crowd of people, large crowd, uh, for a UFO conference. Uh, this past summer, we went to two UFO conferences, one not too far away from here in the Ozark Mountains uh, in Arkansas, and then another in the Joshua Tree Desert in California. So this is the Contact in the Desert UFO Conference. And these are a bunch of people, they are looking up at a object, an object that has showed up in the sky. Uh, it has not been identified. Well, what would we call that? An unidentified flying object, uh, though you may find that uh, now some people in the UFO community will call it a UAP, an Unidentified Aerial Phenomena. There you go, now you're up on the latest lingo, uh, though many still just use UFO. Okay, okay so uh, here's what they're all looking at. So I got all excited, like, oh, oh, we got a UFO, a real one, a live one during a UFO conference. How cool is this? So I ran with the rest of the crowd to the edge, and I'm taking a video. It'll be very hard to see. I'll zoom in, it, zoom in on it 
toward the end. Uh, meanwhile, you will hear David Wilcock, who's the presenter at the time. Uh, he's giving a talk. How many of you have heard of David Wilcock? OK, excellent. Uh, just a few. OK, so he's kind of like the Alex Jones type. But he doesn't talk like this. Uh, he's, you know, he uses a normal voice, uh, but he produces just hours and hours of endless conspiracy theory. He feels the government is run, uh, not the government, he feels the world is run by this cabal, this shadowy secret government uh, that really controls all the goings on. So you'll hear a little bit of that in a reference to Pizzagate, which he feels is a real impressing concern. Uh, the you know, underground political pedophile ring run out of the basement of a pizza shop that doesn't have a basement. All right, so, so you'll hear, look for the UFO. Cannot win this thing. All we have to do is not provide louche. So I'm telling you about stuff in this talk that was very disturbing. I'm telling you about elite pedophilia, satanic ceremonies, advertising this stuff. What that means for me is that this is very serious. They are very serious about their religion. They really do want to follow the precepts of the Georgia Guidestones, in which the population of Earth is lowered dramatically to as little as perhaps half a billion people. OK, so that's drifting around on the wind uh, quite interestingly. It, it was an interesting shape. It was kind of changing shape as well. All right, for those of you who haven't heard the podcast, does anyone have a, a guess as to what that is that we're looking at? Walmart bag, plastic bag. OK, so even David Wilcock, the, the presenter who, oh, by the way, louche, he used that word. We never heard that either. That's his own custom term for this energy that all of these negative forces out there feed upon. So we provide louche for them when we react to all their negative advertisements and media. Okay, so even David Wilcock, who is holding right here a roughly five inch uh, anatomically perfect anatomically perfect replica of an alien human hybrid adult from South America. I don't know how many scare quotes I can use. Uh, that, you know, is verified by anatomists and scientists. Uh, even he quickly looked at that and he said, guys, stop it. It's a plastic bag. So <laughs> you, you were right. That's exactly what it was. So this is what, when I talk about absorbing the dumb, this is the kind of stuff I'm talking about. Now, uh, am I saying that the people are dumb? Not necessarily, because all of us have held beliefs at some point, right, that we now consider to have been um, bad ideas. And so they may be just like us, but at a different point in their personal journey. Uh, I think Mandisa was talking to this brilliantly yesterday. Uh, just, you know, you never know where people are gonna be at. So uh, with that proviso aside, we then went to a couple of the booths surrounding uh, the stage at this UFO conference, and one was selling these scam cell phone radiation protectors that are supposed to keep you safe from all this harmful radiation. So, invented solution to an uh, invented problem. Uh, and then we found this table where I, I assume it was a couple. These uh, two folks are selling pyramids, lovely pyramids, as you can see. And for a mere $50, you can get not only this beautiful pyramid, but the organite energy that it uh, produces. And so, the, the, well, it's got organite in it, it produces orgone energy, there you go. And it's related to uh, sexual energy and the positive creation energy of the, of the universe. And what this does is it sends up a beam that can break up uh, chemtrails because that's also something really to worry about. So yeah, we're talking to them and all of a sudden they're like, whoa, whoa, there's a good chemtrail. And so everyone's getting out to take pictures of it and everything. Uh, what can you do? You absorb the dumb. Oh yeah, so even they, that's right, the whole setup for this, uh, I, I found their podcast later and they're reporting on this particular event. And they even admitted, they said that someone like either found the bag later or got a better look at it and it was a Ross shopping bag. N not my shopping bag, but from the store, Ross. And, uh, and so they even admitted that and yet they still felt that this was significant and showed an alien presence. That somehow this was still an alien craft and they were just maybe appearing as a shopping, I don't know, I don't know what was going on. Another woman later that night, I heard telling a story to someone else, we saw a UFO today. Uh, so this is how rumors get started. All right, this is our most recent investigation. Uh, here we are with a group of flat earthers. Yeah, man, that's, that's the symbol now. Now you know how to tell people you're on the inside. Uh, so 
here we are on the beach watching the sunset with a bunch of people who feel that the earth is legitimately flat. And yes, they do believe that. They really feel that's the case. In fact, they think that the earth looks something like this, uh, where it's a, a you know, roughly circular disk, and the North Pole is in the center, the continents radiate out from that, and then the Antarctic, which we usually think of on a flat projection as looking too large, actually doesn't look large enough because it's really an ice wall that Game of Thrones style encircles the entire planet. And that is what the cabal or the shadow government or whatever it is wants us to uh, stay away from. So they have armed guards there to keep you from getting o over to the Antarctic ice wall. Yeah, so we find that this kind of dumb uh, is associated with others, that it usually comes in a, a package unit. So you don't get just this one idea like, you know, I agree with you on everything else. We landed on the moon. I don't know how that would work in this context, but, uh, but you know, flat earth, that's a weird thing. So you run into people like this, who this gentleman was telling me, you know, not only uh, is the earth flat, but a good way to deal with irritation in your eyes is to rub your own urine into them. I also learned from him the interesting nugget I'd never heard that Obama has uh, drunk pints of baby blood and that's how he gains his power. Uh, and so then he told me that he can move objects with his mind. And ah, now you have my attention. I have been a longtime member of the IIG, the Independent Investigations Group, and you know, we, we test stuff like that. So this is a pretty easy one to test. I say, oh, can you do it now? Yeah, but we'd need like, you know, something with a dollar balanced on a, uh, like a point. I'll be right back. So I get a toothpick, I set this up. And uh, so here he is, moving objects with his mind. So first of all, he realizes, oh wait, that's too far away. Okay, now I can do it with my mind. I'm a little rusty. Okay, so watch him as he moves this dollar with the mere power of his mind. Any theories? What do you think he's doing? He's blowing on it. Yeah, yeah, he's, his mouth is open. He's uh, letting air out, and he's hoping to move it with those currents, and then trying to mimic his hands to where it's moving. Every now and then you'll see it like really jump, and that's when he's just blown a little too hard. There it goes, oh, oops, oops. Okay, so very impressive. Here's me doing the exact same thing and him filming it for me. Oh, oh, lots of kinetic energy there. Oh, wow, I am a mage. You get the idea. So. Yeah, it's, a, it's an easy cheat, uh, so it gives me uh, just a heightened level of confidence in his, uh, his stories about Obama drinking uh, baby blood. So, so why do we do this? Why do we put ourselves through it? Well, A, it's kind of fun. We enjoy it, and you, we get good stories out of it. This is really interesting, and again, it's fascinating to us to see how do people, what, do people actually believe these things? How do they express that? How does it take form? How do they uh, justify, or how do they answer uh, gentle questions. I will, well, really, th this is our only option. We kind of have to do this, uh, go through this absorption process because what are we going to do? Like, start saying, you're wrong. This is ridiculous. What are you talking about? That'll make for a very short meeting because uh, either no one will talk to us anymore or we'll be like physically ejected from uh, the room because, yeah, we'll just be. Uh, you know, troublemakers. So we're never there to make trouble. We're never there to sow the seeds of discord. But we will ask probing questions that hopefully kind of reveal some of the main linchpins that we feel are missing in the argument. Give them a chance to respond to it. And if we don't like the answer, if it's not satisfactory, well, we move on. We're not going to press the point. So that's really all we can do. And I wrote here, the dumb doesn't affect us. Well, we do have our worldview. We have an understanding of how things work. And uh, hearing someone tell me about the flat earth doesn't affect me personally, and the only way it could affect me is if it was convincing and caused me to think. And that's not a bad thing. I should be willing to do that. So there's no net negative here. And it's just the same, me not reacting is just the same as if I wasn't there in the first place. Um, so some things to think about. Uh, then just that process of allowing it to come in, for it to bounce around inside of our heads, uh, it forces us to listen more. 
So, you know, we will ask our probing questions, but then we just, we hear what they're saying. We take it in and then we share it on the podcast and sometimes it's funny, but, uh, you know, at least it gives us a chance to hear them out. And so then when we do say things, hopefully they can be more constructive, more targeted. And in the end, which is kind of uh, almost, it uh, feels oxymoronic that it, it allows our voices to be heard. So if, by being silent, by listening for a long time, then you are a sympathetic ear. And so later on, when you have something to say, they'll, they'll take it in more. They'll say, okay, well, this person is willing to entertain these ideas. Now I'm more receptive to what they have to say. So that's kind of our approach. Now, if you, if you pit you know, skeptical media, atheist uh, shows and stuff like that, you know, you might get a spectrum everywhere from nice to, you know, strident to mean-spirited. And so we like to think that we're on the nicer end of the spectrum, that we fall somewhere around there. And people largely tell us that. We get a lot of great feedback from people saying, man, I, you know, I'm a Mormon, but I felt that your investigation was really positive and thank you for it. We love that kind of feedback. Uh, but... I don't mean to insinuate with that that everybody should follow that exact same approach, that everyone should go out and make carbon copies of our approach, or that there aren't other legitimate ways to uh, express yourself. I feel that everybody, when they're creating stuff for the public, they should, uh, they should express themselves. As long as you're not being a jerk, uh, you know, just be true to your own personality, because wherever you fall on the spectrum, there are people listening who are at that point. And that speaks to what we were saying earlier, that everybody's at a different stage in their lives uh, and, and a different receptivity. And it doesn't matter you know, how you arrange the words. Sometimes coming from you, uh, a person just won't be ready to hear, hear it, whatever that message is. So it's important that we have a variety of voices out there acting out of their own personal, uh, their own personal uh, you know, uh, character traits, their own... Um, their own natural proclivities because there will be people on the other end who are geared to that same channel. All right, so, so we released this show. Uh, it's a lot of fun, a lot of people enjoy it. We, uh, we laugh at things that we find a little absurd. We uh, rate everything at the end for creepiness and for danger value and for pocket drainer and uh, so I said danger, uh, pseudoscience. And so you know, we, we do give our own critical opinion of what we saw and heard. And so everybody likes us, right? Of course not. Of course not. Again, just as we were saying, you know, you're never perfectly aligned uh, with everybody else. So a lot of people hear this and they write us and say, man, I, I really felt you were dismissive. I don't like how you characterized us. So that happens. And so you just have to take those one by one and, you know, accept the criticism, evaluate it, see if you can get better. But sometimes you're just not on the same level. And of course, given... Uh, the opportunity, you would speak differently to any given individual. And we don't have that chance. When you put something out, it's just, it is what it is, and it's going to fall on some ears and, and not on others. So uh, there have been some groups that have not liked us too well. So this is the Melissa Scott uh, Faith Center in Glendale. And this is a long, crazy story. Wait, how much time do I have? Okay, not much. So I won't go into too much detail, but had any of you ever heard of the late uh, Reverend Gene Scott, ever seen his uh, inf infomercials, uh, services? Anyway, so yeah, he was this uh, big personality televangelist. Uh, Werner Herzog made a film about him. Uh, anyway, so he was this crazy guy who would rant at people until they'd give more donations. And uh, he married this young... Uh, penthouse pet. I was trying to think of a delicate way to say it, but you know, this, this woman, he would hire young women to come ride uh, like bare chested on his horses and everything. And so uh, this one of the women that had been kind of hired for that purpose ended up becoming his wife and he ordained her. And then when he passed away, she took over his church. And ever since she has been trying to uh, remove anyone who would speak out against her or question her claim to mastery of over 27 languages. Uh, is that 28? I don't know. Uh, but, um, you know, and, and, you know, she legitimately knows a lot of things that you learn in her sermons. But to get into the service, you have to uh, get a ticket in advance, and they will, I think, do a background check on you because by the second time we tried to arrive, we did get to go to one service, but by the second time, they'd already figured it out. And this is a group of uh, suited 
security guards all wearing earpieces who have stopped us and told us we are not welcome, and they are videotaping us uh, and telling us to leave the premises. Uh, and even when we are not there, there are security guards all around the compound. It's a creepy, creepy church. So they didn't like us so much. And in fact, we felt they were the most vindictive in their response. Here's a, uh, what is it, a critical review uh, Facebook page that was created so they could talk about how terrible we are. And so here we go. Yeah, Ross and Carrie took another shot at Pastor Scott. These two continue to post lies without evidence for their gullible flock. And then this other person says, I can no longer be in this group. I cannot listen to these two anymore. They are too self-centered and annoying. Goodbye. Well, I guess this person said goodbye to Facebook as well because they only have five friends and they haven't posted since this. Uh, and, so, and, and the other account as well, I think might possibly be uh, Pastor Melissa Scott herself posing online because these seem to be just sort of burner accounts. But yeah, they had a very vociferous discussion about how horrible we are. So you can't win them all. Here's a cease and desist letter from the Raelians. Uh, they didn't take too kindly to our coverage of their uh, demystified baptism. Have, has anyone heard of the Raelians? Okay, a, a fair amount of you have. Well, for the rest of you, uh, it's a UFO group. They believe that, um, they claim to be atheists, but they believe that we were created by these aliens on another planet who were advanced scientists. And it's, it's kind of like chariots of the God. In fact, I think, chariots of the gods, I think it was kind of cribbed from that. But the idea is that they can reinterpret Genesis in terms of these visiting aliens. And uh, of course, the guy who founded it, this French race car driver, uh, is now the Maitreya, and he has a posse of uh, young women who serve his every need. Uh, rails angels, yeah, they're kind of gross. So they didn't like us too much. And of course, Scientology, uh, they, for some reason, they waited a long time to actually look us up. And then when they ejected me from a uh, service, for some reason, they waited for Carrie to leave first, and then they confronted me. What's up with that? But uh, then they kept sending me emails, and they invited me to go to L. Ron Hubbard's birthday celebration. So by the third email, I said, well, sounds like you guys really want me to go. So I signed up, again, using my real name, and uh, showed up. And uh, my mistake was that I started posting photos from the audience to our Facebook page. They were monitoring that. And so this guy, Lon, came to eject me. And here he is uh, following me down the street to make sure I get far away from the, from the compound. Well, oh, compound, it's like the Kodak Theater. All right, so, so definitely you can't win them all, but if your enemy is Scientology, you, know, you don't have to lose too much sleep over that. So again, uh, to, to this point, it's very different you know, speaking to the world versus speaking to individuals. And when you're actually sitting face to face with someone else or even keyboard to keyboard with someone else, you can fine tune that discussion and have a more interesting discussion because then you're able to, I'll come back to that, uh, you're able to meet a person where they are to kind of figure out, get a feel for the room or the individual. You know, where are you at in your personal journey? And then, okay, we can take a step back. Instead of saying this is ridiculous, you can say, okay, well, we both care about truth and how do we build our way to this discussion? And you can find that common starting point. And, and I find that a soft answer turns away wrath. And some of you may recognize, I'm quoting the Bible there, yeah, you can do that. There's some good wisdom in there, as well as some other things. But uh, it, it's true. You know, if you respond to someone without getting aggravated, they will respond in kind, usually. Uh, and, and if they don't, then they're the ones who look like the jerk. So going back, uh, we've had some really good stories where, for example, we published our Amazing Facts investigation. That was the End Times group. And uh, so I told them about it because Pastor David in the center there, he'd reached out to me, wanted to talk more. I said, well, hey, I gotta let you know, uh, here's what we published. Uh, would love for you to listen to it, get your feedback on it. And so he listened to the whole series and uh, he came to, to meet with me. And this is with, uh, on the two ends there, two of the other pastors involved. And then Jim in the beard there, he was our friend who attended uh, with us. Carrie wasn't able to attend this particular lunch. But we were able then to invite David on the show and have a conversation with him. And even though we disagreed on some of our conclusions, we were able to find a lot of common ground and end on a really positive uh, note together. We did that as well with the Aetherius Society, which was one of my favorite uh, conversations that we've ever had. And so uh, for me, those are some of my favorite moments of the entire show. And just an example of what you can do when you can actually talk face to face with people. 
So, uh, so this is where I do advocate this, this muscle of absorbing the dumb, which is a muscle. I mean, I, I think we all understand this basic lesson, but it's something that you can practice and you can get better at, uh, because I know I'm constantly working at it myself. And so when you exercise that ability to just not react immediately, you avoid that knee-jerk response of, this is wrong, or we need to settle this right now, and I need to talk you out of this idea because it's stupid, it's harmful. Well, and, and I'll you know, add the proviso there. Sometimes we are talking about things that are cases of legitimate danger, someone's uh, life is at stake, or, or some other aspect of their wellness. So by all means, you can still pause for a bit, but sometimes anger is the right response. I don't want to rule that out. But generally, you know, if you're sitting at the uh, Thanksgiving table, I'm sure this will come up soon, with family, and they ask for everybody to pray, you know what? You can absorb that, uh, and nothing will happen to it. It won't radiate back out into the universe or anything. Thankfully, there is no law of conservation of dumb, uh, because if there was, we'd all be in a lot of trouble, right? And if you can master that, then you, uh, you gain some advantages. You, you get that contemplation. It's almost kind of a mindfulness meditation, if you will. Uh, Theravada meditation, just for uh, Fred out there. i to make sure I get that right. But uh, you know, it, it allows you to stop and, and examine your thinking and say, OK, wh where is this reaction coming from? Is this the right reaction? Should I act on it? And that encourages compassion. It allows you then, by just that examination process, to think, OK, where is this coming from in the other person? Are they saying this out of anger or ill will? Probably not. Most people aren't. And then I find that the, the conversations I regret the most, the conversations I play back in my own head, are those instances where I, I did just you know, respond with my gut reaction. I said the wrong thing. And so uh, it, it's kind of like when you get the angry email and you write out your angry email back and you're like, oh, you suck and here's why you're wrong, point A, B, C, and it's like this two-page thing, and then you just delete it because you got it off your chest at least. You, you processed it, it's not going to be churning in your mind anymore. It's kind of like the equivalent of that. And by doing this, by mastering this with your friends and family at the table or wherever you may be, uh, that will establish you as a friendly, someone that will listen to them, that won't turn everything into a contentious debate, and you, know, you, you won't win the immediate points of scoring a victory, but uh, how many of you would say that you came out of a religious background? I know I certainly did. Okay, that's, I would say, the majority of the crowd. Were you convinced by one person talking you out of it in a single conversation? Did you say, you know what, you make a good point, Jesus doesn't exist, thanks for pointing that out to me. Maybe he did, that's another story. But uh, how many of you were convinced in that one conversation? Yeah, no hands, okay. Because it, it takes a long time, conversions are fast, deconversions are very, very slow. So what this can do is it can plant a seed. Uh, you can ask that one probing question, you can provide that one piece of information, and let it linger, let it gestate there, and you may reap rewards. And the people around you, hopefully, will know that you could care less. Thank you very much.